Not the degrees of freedom, but the degrees of motion. Degrees of motion is like how many are measuring degrees in a circle, right? Um, how many degrees of rotation? How many degrees do we have of motion? So make sure that we're not confusing those. Degrees of freedom, there's one, two, or three, based upon the planes that we have. Frontal, sagittal, transverse. Degrees of motion, we're referencing the actual degree measurement that you would get for angular, mo angular rotation, angular motion. So how many degrees do we have of motion in flexion extension? Zero to 140. Zero degrees is full extension, 140 is full flexion. End feel, what do we expect for end feel at the knee? Um, full extension. What are our options? What are the three choices for end feels? Soft, firm, and hard. Soft happens because of what? Muscle typically. Soft tissues are bumping into each other that restrict motion. Hard comes from what? Bone to bone knock coming together. And then firm comes from what's a firm end feel? What is it? What, what tissue is restricting that motion? Muscles soft when they bump into each other. So what's left? Bone on bone, muscle on muscle, ligaments, right? So we have a tight, taut band, taut, T-A-U-T, taut band that restricts that endpoint. And that's what we're getting on a knee extension. So there are some people who have naturally lax ligaments. Their body is just, they can do that funky double joint stuff. And you can actually go into a negative range of motion. If I put you out in extension, then when I move, <coughs> You can actually hyperextend your knee electively. You'll get some people that have a negative five degrees instead of zero. It's because their ligaments are more lax and it's, a, it's the ligaments that would restrict that extension. So firm end feel on the knee and extension. What do we get on end feel when we go into flexion? What's the end feel on flexion at the knee? Soft, 140 degrees, we come in and the calf muscles bump up against the hamstring muscles. Strong recommendation when you walk out of a class, within that day you go over that course's material. All kinds of research supports that it will stick in your brain better if before you go to sleep you walk through it a second time. Okay, So just take that time, it doesn't have to be a long extension, just read through your notes for 15 minutes and walk out after you're, you're done with class or before you go to sleep and you're going to be a happier, healthier person. All right. What muscles create flexion? What muscle group creates flexion of the knee? I guess to be perfectly fair, we never quite got to that point. back up for a second. What's our second degree of freedom? What's our second motion at the knee? Rotation. rotation. Internal external rotation. What is that rotation called? The rotation at the knee. It has a purpose. What is it called? Screw home mechanism. Savior in the crowd. <laughs> screw home mechanism. What is? What are we talking about with the screw home mechanism? It is actually something that you will embed in your brain. Because I will yell at you if you don't. A lot. What is the screw home mechanism? What's its purpose? That's not its purpose. What's its purpose? Stand up. We'll go through it again. So, screw up mechanism. You're standing up straight. Knees fully extended. Put your hands on your thighs. Jiggle your quads. Oh, so much jigglage. <laughs> Man, it's fat. Except it's not. It's muscle. The muscle just relaxed. Go into a squat. Stick your tushy out. Now jiggle. Nothing. It's not moving. So what does the screw up mechanism do? 
it takes the load off our muscles. Cool, you can have a seat again. So we lock the bones out with a little bit of rotation so that when we're standing upright, so that when we're standing upright, the muscles are relaxed. What creates the screw hole mechanism? What creates the rotation? What creates the screw hole mechanism? What creates that rotation, a second degree of freedom? So this is going to be a concern for me. Because if you let this get by, if you, if you go through a lecture and then you don't remember any of it coming into the next class, you're shooting yourself in the foot from day one. Hands down. Recovery from the first exam is not, what you, not the stress you want to have in your life. And there are some of you that are very good about riding through a couple of classes and then when the exam comes and you can study because you've got the power to do that within you except the retention off of that is poor. So you can, but it won't stay. It has to be small bits. Otherwise, you're going to be pounding so much information in that it just will not retain. And if you get behind off the first exam, it's absolutely going to cause you nightmares. Mechanism. What creates the what creates the rotation? Isn't it because the medial condyle is larger? Yes, the medial condyle is larger. So we have the same axis of rotation, except one wheel is bigger than the other. So, so it rotates farther. Yeah. So it creates a twist. It twists the bones to where the tibia actually rotates. Because that medial condyle keeps going. What unlocks the screw home mechanism? Popliteus. The popliteus. On the other side, starting from underneath. The lateral collateral ligament, the fibular collateral ligament, whatever you want to call it, is a muscle that runs diagonally that internally rotates the tibia so that it unlocks it so you can bend it. So it's created that rotation that saves muscle from using working too much when you're upright. That rotation is created by the <coughs> bony osteokinematics, by the bone sizes, and it's Derotated, it's unlocked by the popliteus muscle. Cool? All right. Good to go. So, we have four primary muscles that create... Four primary muscles that create flexion and four primary muscles that create extension at the knee. So, when we look at this joint here, We've talked about this is full extension at zero degrees. And so if I measure and put a line down here, and that's my center of rotation, and put a line down here, there is zero degrees of rotation in that joint in a normal person. And again, some people are unique, and they'll end up going to where there's a negative value. Just recognize what they are. If it goes negative and they're not supposed to be negative, that's probably a problem. And then with flexion, as it bends up, we're going to get as much as 140 degrees. So the muscles, as we go through a lot of these things, I want to focus on looking at the motions of a joint first. So if you understand the bones and how they connect, you can figure out most of their motions. And then look at those motions and go, okay, so what are the muscles that create that motion? So just like the screw home mechanism, it's created by the different sizes of the, the condyles in the, in the, on the femur. It's unlocked, it's undone by the popliteus muscle. So flexion extension, extension of the knee, extending it out to zero degrees. What muscle group is that? Quadriceps. quadriceps. So break the words apart. How many muscles do you expect to have make up the quadriceps? Four, right? Quads, quadriceps, quadrangle, good stuff. So we're going to add that on. So here's my quadriceps. Pleasantly, three of the four 
have this uh, roughly the same origination point. Intertrochanteric line and medial lip of linea aspera. So we're going to hide a few things out because we don't need to see everything. muscles sitting right in your ear. Three of these muscles are anchored on the, on the proximal femur. One of them actually originates higher up on the pelvis. All four of them combine in at the patella, cross over on the patellar tendon, and then insert on the tibial tuberosity. So feel that for a second. I mean, put your leg up, flex that muscle, you should be able to feel definition on a medial and lateral side. You can feel how that comes into your patella. And then you can actually palpate between contracting and relaxing. You can feel that patellar tendon tighten into its insertion at the tibial tuberosity. Now, with females, some of the, and we'll get into this a little bit with the hip, but the angle at the hip between the way the femur comes down off of the hip is different between males and females. Women have a wider pelvis, this whole childbirth thing. So there's a wider pelvis, which changes the angle of the femur. Because of that, you will frequently find that the vastus medialis, the inside muscle, isn't as um, prominent. It's not as defined. And that just has to do with kind of how that angling comes in. Um, so the four muscles, vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, Dig deep for just a second. And underneath, oh, sorry, yeah. sitting underneath is vastus intermediates. So, directional terms. Three of the main muscles for the quadriceps start with vastus, V A S T U S. Lateralis. Intermedius, intermediate in the middle, and then medialis. It's, you'll frequently hear the vastus medialis referenced as vastus medialis oblique. And the oblique is referencing the direction of the fibers that go in. So we talked about pennate versus fusiform versus longitudinal. So these are more pennate muscle fibers. This is a very powerful knee extensor muscle. So, VMO, vastus medialis oblique. Sitting on top, okay, so all three of these have about the same origination point on the intertrochanteric line, linea aspera, right up proximal femur. Differentiating those is not something I'm going to pick at you. So, if you can recognize they're all proximal femur, we're going to be pretty good to go. They all have the same insertion point, tibial tuberosity, including the one that I hid, which is rectus femoris. Now, rectus femoris has a different name than the others. It also has a different origination point. So it originates on the AIIS, anterior inferior iliac spine. So from looking over your pelvic osteo, you should recognize that, that term a little bit. We'll again push some of that harder when we get into pelvis on the second exam. So AIIS. Now the fact that it's coming on the pelvis makes it different in one way. How is it different from, from the other three vastus muscles, the other three quadricep muscles? What joints does it cross? I mean, it's at the knee, just like the others, 
right? Mm-hmm. At the knee. But if it's crossing over and touching on the pelvis at the AIS right here, then what other joint does it cross? What joint is that? Your hip. So quadriceps, four muscles, three of them have the same name, vastus, vastus, vastus. Three of them have the same origination point effectively. All four of them insert the same, but that rectus femoris starts on the pelvis, which means it crosses the hip. It's a two-joint muscle. We'll see these on occasion. But that means that it gets worked in a little bit different way. So it extends the knee like the other four. What else does it do? If you put a string right in here and it tie that string down to the, to the insertion point, so you put a string from origin to insertion, and you pull that string, what would it do at the hip? Move, Move it how? Which way am I pulling it? Well, muscles only work one way. They only pull. So if I go from here, anterior side, to my knee, and you pull that string, what's it going to do to your hip? Flexes your hip. So your rectus femoris is a knee extensor as well as a hip flexor. You will find that when people cramp up from fatigue, two joint muscles are far more common to cramp before the others. So there's unique components within how they function compared to the others. We would also need to stretch them a little differently because if I'm focusing on stretching, if I have to take the hip into account, then that changes some of that body position. So if I fully flex this knee is to put all of those quads on stretch and then torque the hip up, then I'll pretty much isolate that hip rectus femoris. So knowing the geometry here, knowing the origin insertion is going to give us a clue in terms of how to do eval when you get into lower evaluation. Recognizing there's a difference between one of the four muscles. Okay. Flip it over the back. Group of muscles on the back. Hamstrings. What are the role of hamstrings? What do they do? <coughs> Flex the knee. So the quadriceps extend the knee. Rectus femoris flexes the hip. Hamstrings flex the knee. But they also do something else. So hamstring muscles, you'll find it's, there's four of them. Two medial and two lateral. They have the same origination point. That origination point is called the ischial tuberosity. I-S-C-H. I-S-C-H-I-A-L. Ischial. Tuberosity. And again, if you looked at your pelvis, you'd have that down. So if I had all these out, and I have this nice, big, fat lump right there as an origination point for three of those four pelvic muscles, three of those four hamstring muscles to come off of. This is effectively where you're sitting. It's your sit bone. So if you feel right under the crest, right under the gluteal fold, right under where your cheek hits your leg, there is a nice, big, hard bone under your fingers. That's your initial tuberosity. You are pushing on where your hamstrings originate. Three of the four, anyways. You'll find there's lots of groups that we're going to go through, and there's frequently one or two that are going to slide into an exception within those groups. So I try to learn things by the exception. Group things where you can to help simplify your life a bit. All right, so muscles. Origination point, initial tuberosity. Take your knee, take your leg. Bend it, and then pull your heel down. Or put your foot into the floor and pull it backwards, like you're actively trying to flex your knee. To fire those muscles. And then grab behind your knee, on the femur, proximally. Sorry, distal femur, proximal to the knee. And when you pull back, you should feel two cables coming up from either side, right? So those cables are your hamstrings. 
In fact, when those muscles start dead center on the initial tuberosity, run down and split and grab either side of the knee to pull it. The lateral side should be a single cable. The medial side, you'll have two. Lateral side, biceps femoris. Biceps means what? What's the bi trying to tell you? Two. There's a long and a short head. Medial side, you'll have two. Semimembranosus, semitendinosus. Membranosus is deep, semitendinosus goes further down. So membranosus inserts sooner. So semimembranosus, semitendinosus, biceps femoris, long head. Those three originate on ischial tuberosity. And I'll show you biceps from more short in just a moment. All three of those start on the ischial tuberosity, which is on the pelvis, cross down posterior thigh, cross over the knee to flex the knee. What else are they going to do? What other motion do those three muscles have? What other action can they perform? Think starting point, ending point. What bone are they starting on? What's that? What bone are they starting on? Start with there. What bone are they starting on? Hip. Hip. The pelvis. We'll go there. The hip's the joint, the pelvis. It's on the ischial tuberosity, which is on the pelvis. So that means they're crossing the hip, which means they have an action at the hip. Okay? Rectus femoris in the front, flex the hip. Again, these three muscles, semimembranosus, tendinosus, and biceps femoris long head, originate dead center on the initial tuberosity. So what do you think they're, they're going to do? Extend the hip. They extend the hip. So coming straight off the back, they're going to pull the femur back, pull the hip into extension. Okay? But they also work very strongly to flex the knee. They are predominantly knee flexors, but they certainly have involvement with hip extension. All right, so insertion points. Um, tibia. If you look at the tibia, there's this little groove that sits right here. So the tibial plateau on top. If you come down on the medial side, there's this lovely little groove right below the plateau. Anybody want to know what that groove is called? It's called the groove for the semimembranosus. Tricky, isn't it? What do you think inserts there? Semimembranosus. So it comes in, it's deeper. So things that are deeper will probably start and stop earlier so that more superficial things can go over the top and around them. Semitendinosus is going to drop down into this nice big flat area right here. This big flat area is called pes anserine. Fun, fun. P E Z. And then the second word is A N S E R I N E, anserine, which is down here. Now, there are three muscles that insert here semitendinosus plus two from the hip. We'll go over those when we get further on down the line. When we cover hip motions. Okay? But semimembranosus goes into the groove for the semimembranosus. It's the deeper of the two tendons you can palpate. Semitendinosus drops down and further on. All right. Overlapping anatomy. Um, So what we have here is an image of the medial knee. So it's a medial view of the knee. So this is your femur. This is your tibia. It says tibial collateral ligament coming right down here, which is your MCL, medial collateral ligament. Now this article actually makes a very large point of the fact that it hates that term. And why does it hate that term? Because in many ways, The ligaments that we call ligaments are nothing more than thickenings within a joint capsule. 
which means that there's different components of that joint capsule. The MCL is not entirely unique from the rest of the structures around it. And there's actually several different sections and bandings that come off. I'm not going to push you to pull all of that part out, because you're not surgeons. Good to go? We have a special test that puts stress on the medial knee to know if this complex in here gets damaged. Awesome. What I do want you to pay attention to is how that overlap works. So this is semimembranosus. And again, it goes into the groove right in here on the proximal tibia, just below that plateau. So the semimembranosus comes and slides into its own little groove. Except it's got different bands. So there's an anterior arm, there's an inferior arm. It's reaching out and grabbing in different places. It's directly interwoven with the tibiolateral ligament as well as the rest of that joint capsule. I mean, you can even see, I mean, they make a very strong point of showing that the joint capsule itself actually bleeds directly into that semimembranosus tendon. So recognize that damage to one will, will inherently become damage to another. The tibiocollateral ligament, deeper fibers, we talked about last class, they go and blend directly into the meniscus on the medial side. So if I pull that MCL too hard, I can actually pull up that medial meniscus, if you think back to your unhappy triad. Likewise, if I do things that make the semimembranosus mad, it's going to damage or irritate. Superficially, it's going to damage and irritate the, the, the tibiocollateral ligament as well. So just that blending of how these all kind of come and play together is something that I can simplify it to say there's the MCL on the inside of the knee, but there's a whole lot more of interrelation through fascial connections that matter. So, where does that leave us? Leaves us with the quadricep muscles. What are the action of the quadricep muscles? Extension of the knee. Rectus femoris has a secondary action. What is its action? Hip flexion. Um, flexion of the hip. Okay. What is the motion, or what muscles create flexion of the knee? So if I'm going to flex the knee, flexion of the knee. Hamstrings. Hamstrings. It's like mental gymnastics. You yeah. just gotta kinda, yeah. and I, I would strongly encourage, again, you've got the best cheat sheet that you, you have. So when you read something on paper and it says, you know, what is what muscles create extension to the knee, then extend your knee. Put a little resistance on it. Push into the floor and extend it. Push into the table leg and extend it. But then feel what tightens up. Because then you can go, oh, that's, that's the top extending. Is it, oh, top of my leg, that's quads. Flexion, pull it back, flex your knee. Oh, what's tightening up is my hamstrings. It's in the back. So do the motions to help reinforce what we're talking about. Okay? All right, so extension of the hip is a secondary component of three of the four hamstring muscles because they originate on the ischial tuberosity. So they originate on the hip, on, on the pelvis, excuse me, and they pull that, that femur backwards. Now there's one more little muscle that's kind of hiding in here. So, my hamstring. You've palpated those tendons right there. So my tendinosis, so my membranosis. You've palpated biceps femoris. Now if I hide biceps femoris long head out. Then we have this little guy hiding in right through here. So this is biceps femoris short head. It's, it's, it's attached to like the distal third of the femur. And then joins in with the long head and they have the same insertion point down here. Sometimes when we have a muscle like the biceps, we'll count them as one muscle when we group things. With the biceps femoris, I typically count them as separate muscles. They have different origination points. They have different innervations. And I'll get to show you why later on when we get to the nerves. 
just by the track of the nerves, you'll see how it flows together better. So, four quadricep muscles, four hamstring muscles. Semimembranosus, semitendinosus, rectus femoris, oh, sorry, biceps femoris, short head and long head. Cool? All right, insertion point for biceps femoris. You can feel, find that, find it on yourself. You should be able to make a pretty good guess. So find that tendon, flex that knee with resistance, and then palpate distal until you can't feel that tendon anymore. Where's it go? So your hamstrings start on the same origination point. They split medial and lateral and grab on either side of the knee. You can feel those distal tendons. Where does it drop into? Where does it go? To the head of the fibula. So it's right up here like this. So it comes in, semimembranosus medial, semitendinosus pes anterine, biceps femoris comes in, and both heads work together to grab on the head of the fibula. From last class, what else attached to the head of the fibula? What else is attached there? So, these two tendons right here function pretty much together. It's long head here and short head here, biceps and morphs. But there's another structure sitting up underneath it. You can see it peeking out right there. What ligament? Lateral collateral ligament, or the fibular collateral ligament, whichever you want to call it. So, hiding up underneath there. Deeper is going to be my ligaments and structures. So this is lateral collateral, the same origination point, but diagonal towards Gertie's tuberosity. We have the anterolateral ligament, the one that causes, the, that limits rotation, the one that we damage when we have an ACL tear. Underneath this one, underneath the LCL, there is a muscle that originates on the femur. What muscle is it that originates under the LCL on the femur? Vastus, what are the origin? What, what muscle group is the vastus in? Are all quadriceps. What's the insertion of the quadriceps? Patella and then the tibial tuberosity. Okay. So a lot of times, if you can just if you can look at something and go, I have no idea what you're asking for, and then you want to grab a muscle, then you go, okay, wait, wait, hold on, vastus lateralis. What muscle group is vastus lateralis? And then that's, that's a quadricep, which means that's a different spot. So you got to take those out. Now, biceps femoris goes into the fibular head. Okay, wait, wait, but that's, that's hamstring group, and that's, we just took it off so it's superficial to the LCL. It's outside. We can feel it very easily. I'm asking for something deep to a ligament, which means you probably can't palpate it. And there's only one real instance of this thing kind of a happening like this, to where there's a muscle under a ligament to stabilize a joint. So that little exception, this guy right here. So popliteus, what does a popliteus do? Unlocks the screw on mechanism. So biceps femoris, LCL, Biceps remorse, we just hit out. There's your LCL, and starting up underneath the LCL, on the femur is the popliteus. If I rotate just a hair, you can see where it runs. 
So there's a diagonal muscle banded across to internally rotate that tibia to unlock it from the screw hole mechanism. So that origination point is coming from up underneath that LCL. There's mud. Good to go. That's the majority of the knee. Not so bad. Flexion extension, quadriceps, hamstrings. There's a couple of unique pieces about one of the muscles. Rectus femoris crosses the hip. Biceps short head does not. Condyle sizes, lock versus unlock, lock. The screw home mechanism, the popliteus, which originates under the LCL, unlocks it. <coughs> we have five main ligaments, MCL, LCL. Starting with the LCL is the ALL, anterolateral lateral ligament of the knee. It's a rotation one. And then the two that go through the middle are the ACL and PCL. Anterior, anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament. So again, it's a lot of stuff just to walk yourself through and talk yourself through, and you're going to forget details, which is why by the end of today, you should take the time to do it again. Okay? All right. Moving on. There are lots of muscles that we have in the lower leg. We're going to learn those largely in two different ways. First, we want to talk about the motions that we get that they control. And then we'll go back and group those muscles a little easier. So what are the muscles of the lower leg doing? Yeah. Fire those muscles, move them around, put your hand on your lower leg, and do different movements to see what kind of things you're doing that create contraction of those muscles. Use your body. So we probably need to look at the motions we have at the ankle, because it seems like these are controlling a lot of that. So what motions? How many degrees of freedom do we have at the ankle? Oh. We'll go with three. Now they're kind of funky because it's not clearly planar. It actually, the ankle works in a very much a diagonal pattern. So it's unique and kind of special all at the same time. What else do the muscles of the lower leg do? Beyond just the ankle. So you can see a tendon right here, slides all the way down to the big toe. You can see another tendon that splits, one, two, three, four, goes down to each one of the other toes. So it's extending your toes. On the flip side, there's toe flexors as well. So pretty much the majority of life below the ankle is controlled by muscles in the lower leg. All right? So focus on ankle for a second. You've got the tibia coming down together with the fibula. There's an interosseous membrane. When you looked at your studies, there is, in fact, a line sitting right in through here to support that membrane, both on your tibia and your fibula. So through there is this band of fascia, band of ligament that just is the syndesmosis that binds these two together. You get distal reinforcements of ligaments all over the place. So we will come back to the ligaments of the ankle when we get done. 
fibula makes up the lateral malleolus, tibia makes up the medial malleolus. Together, they create what is called the plafond, P-L-A-F-O-N-D, which is the platform upon which you put all of your load. So it is this platform largely on the tibia that is the tibial plafond. All of that sits on the talus. So frequently when we're talking about the ankle joint that we injure, damage, work with, we have this, the ankle is the tibia and the fibula resting and kind of rotating, rocking on the talus. But then underneath that, you have the talus that sits on top of the calcaneus, which is where we heel strike. It is our heel bone. Nice, big, and broad. So there's actually two different joints that help make up a lot of this movement within the ankle. So easily, between the tibial plafond and So with the tibial plafond, with the tibial plafond on top of the talus, we have a lot of plantar and dorsiflexion. Now if I add in the subtalar joint, which is the talus on the calcaneus, then I can get inversion eversion. So I can get it to where I can rotate that foot in and around. Alright. So we will talk about some of that more soon enough, but that's going to hit a lot of the crux of what we need for the muscles. So, muscles of the lower leg. In a way, we're going to do these by compartments. We'll talk about what they do, but we're going to go over them as compartments. So we have bands of fascia that wrap around individual muscles. And then we have bands of fascia that wrap around groups of muscles to compartmentalize. There are four primary compartments that we have to worry about. Anterior, lateral, deep posterior, and superficial posterior. So give yourself space for each of those because we're going to flesh out what muscles go in each group. Posterior, superficial. Superficial, posterior is probably the easiest one to, to grasp. It's a muscle group called tri tricep psoriac. Two words, triceps, and then the last one, psoriac, S-U-R-A-D. Triceps means what? How many heads are there? Three. Three. Your first one, gastrocnemius. Your gastroc, your calf muscle. Well, the first of your calf muscle.
from the back. Gastrocnemius is your calf muscle. When you're looking at somebody from the back, it's a nice big cut. The gastroc has two heads, medial and lateral. Medial is bigger than lateral. And you'll have kind of a point in which it comes up to and then crosses into your lateral and moves around. Beneath that, now wait, so let's, uh, yeah, we'll hide that for a Underneath the gastroc is a muscle called the soleus. The soleus originates on the soleal line, it's diagonally from the fibular head across the tibia, and then it drops down the entire length and attaches, inserts in with the Achilles tendon with the gastroc, and then inserts into the back of the heel. The last one is this little dude right here, called your plantaris. So plantaris is effectively pretty useless for us. They think it's in that whole evolution thing to where in a different body position, it's more pronounced and used. Once you're upright, it doesn't do a whole lot. There's another one in your hand called your palmaris longus. Again, doesn't do a whole lot, but it's there, so we talk about it. The palmaris longus is cool because we actually rip it out to use in surgeries in the elbow. That's fun. So, um, tricep surrey is a group of three muscles, gastrocnemius, soleus, plantaris. Those make up your superficial posterior compartment. There's not a lot of fascia around the posterior side that causes issues. So you can contract and flex and that muscle can get quite pronounced and you don't have any issues with it. That's when we get deeper that we start having some headaches. Now one thing I want you to pay attention to though is the origination point of the gastroc. What bone is that? A, it splits because you have two heads, right? So they go medial and lateral. But what bone is that? It's the femur. So the gastroc is actually originating above the knee joint. So it is a very strong, the whole tricep serrate group is a very strong plantar flexor. It helps propel us, push us, push us forward, jump up. But that gastroc originates above the knee, which means it also does what? Weakly, but it doesn't. Flexes the knee. So because it's on the posterior side, if it pulls, it's going to create a little bit of a knee flexion there. Preseason soccer, I frequently get a lovely little athlete who did nothing all summer, comes in and pulls proximal gastroc. So they'll get a muscle strain behind the knee. They'll get pain behind the knee and they start complaining about it. You do a palpation, flex the knee a little bit, find those hamstring tendons and then come in. And that's where they're going to say they have pain. And you're pushing on nothing but soft tissue. And you can feel it. So put your knee up, find your hamstring tendons, and go medial. Go inside behind the joint. And they're soft and squishy. doesn't feel great to smash on it. But it's there. That's all gastro. That's the origination point of the gastrocnemius. So hamstring tendons kind of on the outside outline the, the popliteal space behind the knee. And that is covered by that gastrocnemius. Okay? Now it's a booger to rehab because there's just, again, it's, it's kind of a funky spot and they tend to have to kind of just rest it out. Not terribly fun and exciting. So, all three of those tricep surrey, so the gastroc, the soleus, and the plantaris blend together to make the Achilles tendon. Superficial posterior group. We rotate a little bit lateral. And I want you to find the biceps femoris tendon as it inserts into the head of the fibula. So find that head of the fibula. And then go just distal by about an inch. As soon as you roll off onto the neck of the fibula, as soon as you get down into this region, right in through here, you're pushing on muscle again. That muscle is called the fibularis longus. So it's easy to remember because it's the fibula bone. It's the first one you're going to feel, which means it's the long one. And if there's a longus, there's probably a brevis. So sitting underneath it is your fibularis brevis. Go way down below. It's like the distal third of the fibula. These two muscles make up your lateral component, compartment. Fibularis longus and brevis, they run along the fibula shaft. And then 
What motion do they do? That gets a little bit trickier. So put your finger, find your lateral malleolus, and evert your foot. So, sorry, invert. Evert, evert. So inversion is there, evert your foot. Pull your big toe down and your pinky toe is out lateral. And you should be able to feel these muscles get taut. Some of you will actually feel it slide up and over the, the lateral malleolus. So both of those together, if you put your hand on the muscle bellies themselves, when you do that, you'll feel them specifically contract. So we'll get into the insertion point. Brevis is going into the fifth metatarsal. So it's grabbing that, the side of your foot and pulling it out. Longest is a little funnier because it actually, another reason it's longer is that this guy right here. Oh, that's good. That guy You'll see it tucks up underneath the foot through that little passageway. When we get to the bones, we'll talk about these passageways a little more though. But instead of grabbing right here, it actually wraps all the way around under the foot to grab the medial side of the foot and pull it out. So brevis grabs the outside, longus reaches underneath to pull the medial side out for eversion. So you remember how we talked about lever arms in the beginning? Which do you think has a better lever arm? Brevis or longus? Longus is going to go further beyond the point of rotation, so it's got a much better lever arm. Because again, the further away from that center of rotation you are, the, the less force you need to create the same amount of torque. All right. So lateral compartment, just two muscles. Fibularis longus, fibularis brevis. They create eversion. So if I take my gas rock, I hide it out. Take my Achilles, hide it out. Take my triceps and my soleus. And we're looking at a posterior view. We're looking at a posterior view of our muscles. There are three muscles in the deep posterior compartment. Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tom is tibialis posterior. That's convenient. It starts on the tibial bone and it's in the back. Tibialis posterior. Easy enough, right? We're not trying to be tricky. Dick is flexor digitorum longus. Hence the D for digitorum. Flexor digitorum longus. And then Harry is flexor hallucis longus. Hallucis. What is that? Big toe. H A L L U C I S. Hallucis longus. That's it. There's three there. One more compartment, anterior compartment. So if I have a tibialis posterior, I probably have a tibialis anterior. Brilliant. If I have a flexor digitorum longus, I probably have a, well, brevis, but we can go the other way. Extensor digitorum longus, because I'm looking at the other side of the body. And if I have a flexor hallucis longus, I probably have an extensor hallucis longus. So for the most part, it's just a mirror image of each other, except we have one more little dude that kind of sneaks in there, just to throw you off. And that's this guy right there. So anterior compartment has one more little dude called fibularis tertius, tertius being the third, or third, because you're going to forget about it, it's going to drive you nuts. 
So anterior compartment has a fourth muscle, which is called fibularis the third, fibularis tertius. So it works with your longus and brevis in everting that foot from where it grabs. Anterior compartment by far is our most concerning when it comes to injuries because we can get too much pressure built up if there's in, uh, damage or inflammation, which can impact our, blood, our ability to have blood supply, innervation, that kind of stuff. And you'll get to that in ortho. All right. Cool. It's 110. We still have five minutes. That clock's fast. We should be fast. So, four compartments. So, you need to review your knee stuff. You need flexion, extension, screw hole mechanism, how it comes about, how it's unlocked, the ligaments of the knee, your four compartments. One thing we will add in at some point is the, the neurovascular, neurovascular structures that go within the compartments because it has a direct impact on how you would manage injury or what you would be concerned about with injury. Uh, next class, we will get into much more of the structure and function of the ankle and the foot for the bones and how they align. Uh, so a lot of the accessory structures as we go, and then we'll have to get into the foot intrinsics, which is all the small muscles that are just found within the foot itself. So there's still more to go. Uh, intro to patient care. Who's in that class? The two of y'all? Um, do you have class at 12? You do. Do you have class at 12 on Monday, Wednesday? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um,